You're on the you're on your third slide. False prophets. A false prophet rising. So we do have we have to be so careful about where we are and and understand the climate in which we live in because Satan is not playing. And the thing that has, has protected me, I think more so in this season of my life, is God has sent very strategic prophetic voices to me. And people that I don't know, people outside of my region, because I travel a lot, so people outside of my region that have given me more clarity about where I am and who I am and what, I, what I'm supposed to be doing. And so we have to be very, very, oh, well, you have to be careful who you're listening to. You need to check, like I, I'm very, if I don't see a statement of faith on your website, or if I'm not clear about what you believe, I'm not going to listen to you. So, so here is so here is my statement of faith. I'm going to go through it. So the first thing is, I believe in the unity and the power of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. God is in heaven. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the only entity of the Godhead that is operating in the earth realm. The Bible says that, that um, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ and that Jesus was full of the power, that he walked in the power of the spirit. And when he was launching his disciples, he breathed on them and said, receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So the, the gospels are closing the old covenant. And then now we're moving into the books of, book of Acts of, is where we come in. The next thing I believe is I believe in the efficacy and the efficiency of the blood of Jesus. And it is a perpetual covering. We don't have to perpet we don't have to always declare, I, I decree the blood of Jesus. It is a perpetual, the blood of Jesus is a perpetual motion in our lives. That it is always in operation. When the children of Israel put the blood over the doorpost, the spirit of death passed over, but they only had to put it over once. They didn't have to keep applying it. The blood of Jesus is, is always in motion in your life. I believe that the Bible is the inspired, infallible, unchanging, and living word of God. And so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in more discussion. That that the Bible we have to believe the Bible is completely accurate. It doesn't need any, yeah, we have books, we have devotions and stuff that we read, but the Bible needs no additional support outside of itself. The Bible was not written by men, but it was written by the Holy Spirit that moved on men to write the Bible. Because it is alarming how many people don't really believe that the Bible is completely accurate and true. And you'll hear people that have been in church for years, oh, man wrote, a man wrote the Bible, you know. And so one of the foundational principles of what I'm teaching is that the Bible is completely accurate. No errors, infallible. The next thing I believe is in the complete healing power of Christ through the Holy Spirit for every believer. God said that by Jesus said on the cross, by his stripes, we are healed. There is no sickness, no disease, no malady, no infirmity that can overtake your body because God is a healer. We get sick in our minds before we ever get sick in our bodies. And if something would happen to attack us, then we have complete authority over it. I wrote it in, in my blog today that about the prophet, the evangelist John G. Lake. He was in Africa on a missions trip and they put a virus in his hand and it died on impact. We have authority over every sickness, over every disease. Nothing can take you out. My um, perpetual mantra over my life is I'm not gonna die. I'm not gonna die from sickness or disease. I'm gonna die when I'm done. When I'm done, when my earthly assignment is finished, that's when mortal will take on immortality. And nothing can take out my life prematurely. No demon, no devil, no accident is going to snuff out my life before I'm finished. And I cancel, I'm on, I'm always on, I cancel every demonic assignment against me. I cancel every curse, every witch, everything that wants to come against me and my purpose, it is canceled by the blood of Jesus. I believe without faith that it is impossible to please God. And we know that scripture, but faith is, I'm understanding another level of faith in God. And faith is not, it is not contingent on what we see. And I know we've heard that so many times, but it is not contingent on what we see. 
when I quit my corporate job and I was getting six figures, six figures, you know, I had a lot of resources, a lot of money, and I was, and it was a great job. But when God moved me off my job, I had to trust him. I had to, I had to trust that everything that I needed to be taken care of financially would appear. And it just appears. If I'm like, God, I need to take care of this. I need to do this. I need to pay my car note. I need to pay whatever it is. It is always supply. God will move on somebody's heart some type of way because God is a provider. Um, David said, I once was young and, I, and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bed, bread. And God will not withhold any from them that walk, anything from them that walk up rightly. So you have to know, I just decree right now, I feel an unction to decree right now, whatever you're, you need in, in the realms of the financial, whatever you need from God, I decree that he is releasing faith, the gift of faith to believe that he will supply every single thing that you need in your life right now. The, the, the issue becomes is we don't know how to pull what God has supplied out of the heavenly realm. We have to learn how to access things in the, in the heavenly realm and pull them down to our realm. Because God, will, God is, when God says he's done something, it is already done. It is already supplied. The next thing I believe, I believe in the resurrection of the only begotten son. And I, we all believe that. We believe that Jesus rose. I heard um, a friend of mine told me, a psychologist said, she was talking about the death of Jesus and it was, the parameter was healing. And, you know, she said, you know, Jesus died on, was crucified on Friday, but he rose on Sunday. And she said, don't, when it comes to healing, don't let anybody rush you through your Saturday. And I thought that was so powerful. The next thing I believe, hold on. I believe with confession, the salvation of the soul is activated. That we can't just believe we're saved. We have to make that confession that we are saved. And I, I'm already, I'm already instructing my grandchildren to make that salvation. They're very young and they may not understand what they're doing, but I'm getting them in the in the rhythm of declaring their salvation. So when they are old enough and they do understand that it will already be in them. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I don't necessarily believe that speaking in tongues is evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I believe it is a portion of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, you know, the Holy Spirit comes on our lives in two different ways. The Bible says that we receive the Holy Spirit as a down payment a guarantee for our future salvation. And then we receive him in power as in the book of Acts. And, and, the, and the reason we see him in power, because the Bible says in the book of Acts too, that we receive him so we can be witnesses of the res. The Holy Spirit is really, really a witness of the resurrected Christ because it is the spirit of the living God Jesus was the man, Christ was the anointing. It was the spirit of the living God that, that Jesus, that helped, that um, moved Jesus out of the grave. It was the power inside of him, that Zoe kind of life that won't quit or won't falter, that, that, Je that caused Jesus to rise from the dead. I believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit and that all the gifts of the spirit are in full operation today. And so we're going to talk about that in depth because those are really not gifts of the spirit. They're the manifestation of the spirit. It is how the spirit manifests himself in a church setting. That, that passage in 1 Corinthians is a, pet, is a church setting. How does this Holy Spirit operate? So one of the issues with church today is we don't see all the five gifts in operation you very rarely will see prophetic voices in a church very rarely because people are not comfortable with it comfortable with it they don't know how to manage they don't understand it and so i believe that in order and jesus wrote in scripture in order for a church to be fully functional you have to have all five gifts in operation and so we're going to talk about the manifestation of the spirits and the context around that and meeting with my mentor today, I was getting some clarity on some of the things that I, I'm going to teach, but just to make sure that I was in line biblically. One of the things he said to me, I could, I knew it 
experientially, like I knew there was another dimension of ministry that I, I needed to move into, but I couldn't articulate that. And he was explaining to me that prophetic people need to align with apostolic ministry. They need to align with apostles because that's what opens up realms of jurisdiction to people. Like I'm connected to an apostolic ministry in Nashville, um, Dallas, Oklahoma City, and then several in California. But it, it makes room for a prophet to function because most prophets really are itinerant. But every prophet needs a home base. I meet so many prophetic people that don't go to church. They don't want to, and a lot of it is because the, they feel rejected or they're uncomfortable or people don't understand them or think they're a witch or all that kind of stuff. I had a person tell me, they said, if I didn't know you any better, I would think you were a witch. And so I, I'm, I'm believing that as we, as we train and, and um, move through the word that God will bring some healing in your hearts and in your minds. And Lisa, I just want to speak to you just real quick, if you don't mind. I just feel like there's been some challenges in your life, specifically around ministry. And that God wants to heal every single wound and every single hurt in your heart. That you were not off. Mm. You were not wrong. People, What people thought was the demonic was really the power of the Holy Spirit. They just did not understand. And they just did not understand you. It wasn't, I don't believe they intentionally meant to hurt you. They just did not understand the flow of the prophetic in your life. But in this, this, I feel like over the next three months or so, God's going to bring such a deep healing and cleansing because oh, if hold we don't on, bro. cleanse wounds, if we don't cleanse wounds, they get infected. And so I'm just going to stretch hands towards you right now because there's no distance and time and space in the spirit. And so God, I decree the healing power of the Holy Spirit, not just over her mind, God. God's going to renew some things in your mind, but over your heart, God. Over her heart, God, I ask that you heal her heart, heal her emotions, Lord God. And Father, but that you connect her with people that can help her grow in the prophetic and help her and that understand who she is, not just as a prophet, but as a person, Lord God. And Father, we decree it so in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The next thing I believe is I believe there is a mandate on every believer to walk in the love of Christ. As a prophet, one thing God showed me about the prophetic, the prophetic is not a punitive gift. We're not pointing fingers at people and you're going to hell. You, that, that is not the prophetic. The prophetic is redemptive. It is a redemptive gift. It is a gift to draw people to Christ. And so prophets have to walk in love more than any other gifting. Because we wield so much power. And, and I tell people like all the time, like God has really softened my personality. He really has. Because I used to have a horrible temper. I read a quote, I read a meme that said that basically they avoid conflict because they could go from zero to life in prison in two seconds. I used to have an explosive temper. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> It was really bad. When I was younger, in my early 20s, it was like, it didn't take anything to make me mad. But God has so honed and sharpened my personality. And I know a lot of it was through rejection, you know, just feeling rejected, not feeling wanted, not feeling I was a part, you know, because rejection is a powerful tool. If we don't learn to manage it, because it's part of the gift, you're going to be rejected. That you have to accept. But if we don't learn to manage it, under the Holy Spirit, in the realm of the Holy Spirit, it can hurt and it can cause a lot of people not to want to operate in their gifts. And they kind of relegate themselves to the background. The next thing I believe is I believe that God is love and the only begotten son died to give every person the opportunity to receive and accept eternal salvation. I believe every man, every woman, every boy, every girl has an opportunity to be saved if they want to. Salvation is a choice. It's not something God's going to push on you. I remember one of my old pastors said there was a young man that would come in his church and um, 
he just kept feeling this impression in his spirit that the young man needed to be saved. But every week he would say, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. And the last time that he came in, he just felt, you know, the, the impression was getting stronger. And he was telling me, you know, let me introduce you to Christ. And he said, I'm not ready. And the young man left the church and he was dead in five minutes. He got hit on his motorcycle and killed instantly without ever accepting Christ. So it's a choice. People choose to, people choose to accept Christ. People, and I'm a, I'm a mother. I have five kids. I can't even, I can introduce my children to Christ, but I can't force them to be saved. It, it has to be their own choice. And I thank God that all my children have confessed Christ. But as a parent, you can't even force your children to be saved. It is, it's a choice of man. But they are given the opportunity. People are presented with the opportunity. We, none of us will never will ever leave this earth and say that we never had an opportunity to accept Christ. So now I'm going to talk about worldview, which I think is really, really important where we are. So worldview is this. Everyone has a lens that they look at the world through. And the way we look, and this is, I didn't write this, somebody else wrote this. And the way we look at the world makes all the difference in the world. It determines how we define reality as well as how we relate to each other. Everybody has a lens which they interpret where life comes from, why bad things happen, and what their purpose or existence really is about. As a prophet, you have to have a biblical view. Everything in life, we have to look at it through the lens of, of the Bible, even when bad stuff happens. And bad things happen to us. You know, tragedies happen, things happen. That's part of living in this world system. But we have to understand that when they do happen, that there is a plan and there is still a purpose for God. Some things happen that are demonic. There is actually demonic activity that we may, may, may not have had the wisdom to be able to curtail. But we have to look at everything, even COVID-19. We have to look at everything through the lens of the Bible that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Even though we're in a pandemic, God is still doing something on the other side. I heard a prophet say that we're in, that we're not in the Christians. We're not in a, a pandemic. We're in a forced Sabbath. And I've heard so many people getting healed during this time of their lives where God is just really giving them rest and not just rest to sleep, but rest in their souls. Most of us need rest in our souls. We've been through a lot. A lot has happened. You know, there are still um, areas of trauma that we're still dealing with in our lives. And God needs God needed to rest some of us in our souls. Because I believe that all of you are very high level women and men that will be watching the replay. And so we don't know how, I don't know how to rest all the time. I don't know how to slow down. I don't know how to stop all the time. And so God has really put me on pause during this season of my life. That I've rested in this year more than I've rested in any other year in my entire life. And so I believe that he wants us to give us rest because the Bible says that Satan is the enemy of our souls. And because my anointing primarily is to marketplace prophets, that um, we have to understand that I read a devotion that said faith in, no fatigue in, faith out. The more tired you allow yourself to become emotionally and physically, the more you lose the ability to operate in faith. And so God wants to rest us and rest our souls. Jesus said that my yoke is easy and that my burden is light. And we have to learn to carry the burden of the Lord as opposed to the burden of this world system. Because the Bible says the world will choke everything out of you. That the cares of this world will choke everything out of you. Move you over here. Like, so how do we know? And this is always the question of the hour is like, how do we know the Bible is true? So let me ask you guys a question. How do you know? I'll meet your little sales. How do you know the Bible is true? Because God said so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For me. Amen. Equala. This. Oh, anybody else? How do you know the Bible is true? I think it's it's a um a opportunity to walk by faith. I believe God introduces himself through his word and then you have to believe that it is true. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. Mm -hmm. 
Ms. Marcy? Um, I guess my answer will be similar. It's just walking by faith. I mean, of course, along the way, I've had pockets of doubt and, or, or not doubt, but questions that I myself couldn't answer, mm -hmm. which, you know, if you're not careful to manage it, it can bring on doubt. So I'm, I'm not really sure how to answer that other than walking by faith. And I know what God has done for me, not just through his spirit, but that his spirit and it's matched his word. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Yolanda. Yeah, I was just, I was thinking what you said that, um, the Bible, the Bible has kind of been my roadmap to get to know who Jesus Christ is. Mm -hmm. so the evidence of it being real is how he's moved in my life for me. Yeah. Uh, it's not only just reading, understanding it, but walking it out and allowing him to walk me through whatever journey he, I was going through at the time. So to me, it became a reality once I started, started to study his word. Awesome. So that's the question of the hour. So how would we articulate that to people? I was watching, I would encourage you, I watched Billy Graham's biography on Netflix and it was so, so powerful because we, we, we all know who Billy Graham is. I actually got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. But what I didn't know about his, his, his ministry is there were two other men that started out with him, with him and they were slated to be you know, powerful evangelists just like him. But as we, as we have seen historically, Billy Graham's ministry um, went on and just became dynamic. He was America's pastor and thousands and thousands of people got saved. And he said he was at a place in his, in his ministry where the two other men said, you know what, the Bible's not really true. How do we know the Bible is true? And he said, you know, his mind said, he started thinking that like, how do I know the Bible is really true? How do I know this is the word of God? And he said, I, he went into, he said, I, I went into the wilderness, into the forest, and I took my Bible with me. And I said, God, I don't know if this is true or not. I don't know if this is your divinely inspired word, but I'm going to accept it as it's true. I am going to, by faith, Lisa, what you said, by faith, accept that this Bible is completely true and accurate. And it changed the entire course of his ministry. When I go back and listen to Billy Graham preach here and there, he will say, and the word of God says, and the Bible says, we have to be students. I just, if I can encourage you more than you have got to be a student of the word and not just knowing scripture, but studying scripture, dissecting scripture. I have like four or five resources that I use to help me dissect scripture, to help me get a clear understanding because it's not always clear, but to get a clear understanding what I think the Holy Spirit is saying. And then if it's not clear to me, then the Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth. And he will bring me clarity, but you have got to know that word because so many people are out there preaching and they do not know the word of God. Are they mishandling it? Are they misinterpreting it? And what happens when the Bible gets misinterpreted is that it leads people astray. It gives Satan an opportunity. Satan's number one job. We're gonna, I'm gonna break down the, the satanic realm and strategies and angels and all that. But Satan's number one tool is to deceive and beguile mankind and lure them away from God. And so many people are being lured away from God because they really don't know and understand the scripture. Or they heard a scripture wrong or somebody told them this or somebody told them that. And so that, that is why I wanted to start off here because this is going to be the foundation from which we spring forth. So how do we know this true? I didn't make any more notes. So um, this is what I wrote. The Bible, oh my gosh. This is doing too much for me. The Bible is a living, breathing document. It is not outdated or irrelevant. And we have to believe the Bible is absolutely true without error. Second Timothy 3.16 says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God or is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so the reason we have to have a, a biblical worldview, because we live in what's called, you know, postmodernism. And postmodernism is that what, if I think it's true, then it's true. It's um, interpretation of religion. Postmodernism is interpretation of religion emphasizes the key point that religious 
Um, religious truth is highly individualistic. It, religion is what I believe it to be. It's subjective and resides within the individual. So truth to me is what I determine truth is. If I, if I don't believe the Bible is inerrant, then if I say it's true, and that's why we have, that's why we see this homosexual agenda coming forth. And what people don't understand is that their assault is really against the church. It's not against society. It's against the word of God. Because the word of God says that it's not true. And it's that, that it is a violation of God. Homosexuality is a violation of God. And so we have to, we have to, that's why we have to settle now that the word of God is completely true and accurate. So divine inspiration, prophecy has to line up with the word. And first Peter, second Peter 1 20 says this. Recognizing this above all, that every prophecy of scripture does not come about from one's own ter interpretation. I don't prophesy out of my human flesh. And I am very, very careful that when I'm saying something to somebody, that it is coming through the spirit of prophecy, through the Holy Spirit. And if I'm not sure that I'm saying something accurate to somebody, I would say to Lisa, did that bear witness with your spirit? Because I want to know that I'm being accurate. It says that um, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but, but men carried along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Prophecy has never been birthed out of human ability, but has always been the enablement of divine inspiration. The scripture warns us that, that the, prophet, the prophet about speaking words are not divinely inspired. Inspired, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 18.22 says this, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, because that is a key that you are truly prophetic, because prophets operate under three realms, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and then the prophetic. Hey, woman of God, so somebody from India just joined. Thank you for joining. Um, it says, that, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And there's another passage where, where the God was like, I am tired of the prophet stealing prophecies from one another. You can see in this, this see, see in this, um, in the season that we're in, that people are stealing prophetic words from one another. You don't know what's true. You don't know who's saying it. And you can just see this duplication, but none of it is bearing witness in the spirit. Because I, prophecy is more than you're going to get a car. And I know we've heard this, but you see a lot of it. Prophecy is more that you're going to get increased. Or you're going to get a car. Or you're going to get a new house. Prophecy is way more than that. That is the elementary principles of the prophetic. I was taught that, that prophesying is the least responsibility of a prophet. That is your least responsibility to prophesy. One of your primary responsibility is to bring order. Prophets come on the scene when it's time to tear down or build up a work. And every church that God sent me to when I was in church mode, when it was when I was in the season of going to church on a regular basis, they were either in the middle of a building plan, always in the middle of a building. And I'm like, God, why do you keep sending me to churches that are building stuff? Because that's when prophets need, because they are part of the governmental foundation of the church. We are part of this church structure. And so how do we know that the Bible is true? Um, this is, I didn't write this either, but I got this from somebody. It says, the truth of the Bible is obvious to anyone willing to fairly investigate it. Um, the Bible is uniquely self-consistent and extraordinarily authentic. It has changed the lives of millions of people who have placed their faith in Christ. It has been confirmed countless times by archaeology and other sciences. It possesses divine insight into the nature of the universe and has made correct predictions about distant and distant future events with perfect accuracy. The psalmist wrote, the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hand. That's how we know that the Bible is true. And we have to settle in our hearts and spirits as we go forward. Because one of the ways that we actively operate in, in, in spiritual warfare and overcome spiritual warfare is by knowing and understanding the word of God. Jesus overcame spiritual warfare by saying it is written. And if we don't know what is written, how are we going to defeat the enemy? Satan is not going to bow because we tell him to bow. He's not going to cast out because we want to cast him out. 
we have authority in the word of God because the Bible says God works all things out according to the counsel of his own will. And then we know the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. If we don't settle that foundation, we will not be effective in prophetic ministry. We have to know it, know it, know it, know it. Because we are, we are in a season where deception is high. We are in a season where people are mishandling and misusing God's people. And because you can go online and prophesy at the, at, uh, the touch of a button, it's more rampant than it's ever been. And I don't listen to a prophet if I don't know anything about them. And if I feel like their word is true, I'm going to do a little bit of research to see what they believe, where they come from. And you have to, you all have to always have somebody to vouch for you. Like one of my mentor was telling me today, he said, you know, cause I, I, I was telling him, I was confirming and affirming to him that, you know, this is my home base. When I'm in town, this is um, where I, I'm going to come and worship. And he said, he said, that's good because I can, I am your resume. I can vouch for you. I can vouch for your accuracy. I can vouch for your lifestyle. If you can mute yourself, the person that just got on, I'd appreciate that. But I can vouch for you as a person. So if somebody calls me and says, you know, we want to bring her to our church, what do you know about her? You have to always have somebody to be able to vouch for you. And see, a lot of prophets, you don't know who's vouching for them. Can you, can you call somebody and say, hey, tell me about this person's character? And that's so important as we move into the prophetic because I feel like my job in the kingdom, part of my job is to heal prophetic people, but to raise up prophets that are not for profit. Because if you have any type of wound, you are going to be for profit. I don't care if it's emotional or financial, you're going to be for profit. And so we have to make sure that we are healed. We have to make sure that we are whole. We have to make sure that we are students of the word, students of the word. I try to read my Bible every single morning. I don't always reach that goal, but I, I, try, I read my Bible at least five times a week, at least. And when I read it, I have two other references with me to help me research and study and commentaries and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, sometimes I'll just get stuck on one scripture that will leap out to me. And I want to know what the context is of that scripture. Because we are building up our arsenal. We are building up, you know, we are building up, we are fortifying our spirits. We are strengthening ourselves. I've had in the last, I would say three years, I have had two demonic um, encounters, two demonic visitations in my room within the last um, about three years. And if I wasn't built up in the spirit, it would have rocked me to the core. It still rocked me now but it would have rocked me to the core because Satan is really serious. And then I was telling my mentor, one of the things that has kept me out of, I know that I'm itinerant. I know I'm supposed to travel. I know that the foreign sands are calling me. I've been to Nigeria and I've been to Israel. I know the foreign sands are calling me, but one of the things that has kept me out of that is my fear of spiritual warfare. I'm like, Lord, I'm not ready. When I went to Nigeria and it's interesting when I went to Nigeria, the pastor's wife was like, they had this thing called the dungeon. And there was a woman in there that was demon possessed. And they, you know, asked me, come on down here. We need your help. Her eyes were completely black. You could not see her pupils. And the pastor's wife opened her mouth and poured anointing oil. But we cast that demon out of that woman and her countenance was completely different. So it's interesting that the two demonic visitations that I had were Africans because I opened up a portal in Africa, you know, I'm known there. Because remember the, the, the demon said, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? And I heard a prophet say, he said, our names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. So our names are written, the Bible says our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we don't have to worry about our names be, being put in the Lamb's book of life. The Bible says, worry about your name being blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. But our names are in the Lamb's Book of Life because demons know who have power and who have, has authority. So if your name is in the Book of Life, they know you have authority. The sons of Sceva want to do the same thing that Paul was doing. And the Bible says the demons overtook them and ran them out of the house. 
we want to be, one of my goals is that you're fully equipped in spiritual warfare too. Because things are shifting and things are changing and spiritual warfare is leveling out because of COVID-19. You know, there's a prophet that he said that he saw a few years ago, he saw sharks coming to the edge. You know, sharks didn't used to come inland. You know, they used to stay out there, but they started coming closer, closer, closer and closer to the shore. And he asked God, what is going on? He said, the hedge is lifting. So we're seeing all these things hit America. You know, we have never had a war on, on domestic soil. It's always been on foreign soil. But we're seeing, we saw 9-11. We've seen COVID-19. We're seeing, you know, ships and, you know, sharks coming closer and closer to the shore attacking people. But we have the power to raise up the hedge again. But the hedge is lifting on America. The protection is because we are violating the principle of this homosexual agenda, shifting the hedge. You know, abortion, shifting the hedge. My kids are prophetic. My daughter had a dream that, you know, she saw a billboard and it said New York's going to be judged. And what happened in New York at the beginning of COVID-19, it was hit really hard. New York was hit. And one of the believe, reasons I believe it was hit is because of the law that was just passed about abortion, that you can abort a baby at any age, any, any month, you can abort a baby. And I remember years ago, they, they had passed what was called the partial birth abortion. And I wrote a letter, letter to President Clinton where they, they would, what they do is they birth a baby, they pull the head out, and they inject saline into the brain. And these are children. And, and God spoke to me. He said, you know, concerning the, um, when all the protesting was going on, he said, revenge or revival. And I believe it's revival, but God is, God is going, God has to respond to the shed of innocent blood. He has to respond. And so things are shifting and we have to be fully equipped. I believe that the stage is shifting and turning. That most of the prophets that are prophets of God, they are in the caves. Juanita Bynum said, God, prophets don't come out of the cave until God has something to say. If we look at um, the life of Elijah, Elijah felt like he was the only one. And God said, I have 700 prophets that have not bowed their knee to Baal. And Obadiah, not Obadiah the prophet, but Obadiah, um, Ahab's um, administrator was hiding prophets 50 to a cave and he was feeding them water and bread, feeding them refreshment and the word of God. He was feeding them bread, the word. And so we are in the caves and it's time for us to, to be, have a strong diet of bread, a strong diet of the word of God, because the scene is going to be shifting and people are going to start looking as things roll out. We haven't even experience the fallout of this economy yet with all this stuff shutting down we haven't even experienced it god showed me in 2018 2000, early 2019 that the stock market was going to completely crash and i wrote on my my facebook that, that we are going to experience economic downturn unlike we have never experienced companies that have been um, in business for years decades are going to go out of business i saw amc theaters getting ready to file bankruptcy. They said if they don't open up in the next couple of months, they're file, filing bankruptcy. So things are happening and shifting in our economy. We know that God's going to provide, provide for us, but people are going to be looking for a true prophetic voice. When you see the, a prophet in the Old Testament, the Bible said there weren't very many of them. And that's what lets me know that a lot of these, a lot of these voices are not, they're not true voices of God. Um, you see Ahab asking, hey, is there a prophet in the land? They had to find a prophet of God. They weren't just walking around. They had to locate one. And so I want to encourage you guys that as we go, be prayerful as we move forward. Um, ask God. One, things that, one of the things I ask God for, God, as, as I teach, release the spirit of revelation. Release the spirit of revelation. Help me help me um, uncrack the scriptures in a way that we can understand, in a way that we can apply, because I believe that God's going to do something significant in these groups, that, these trainings that I created.
because they were initiated at the hand of the, li of the living God. So I'm gonna open up now for um, questions. Anybody have a question? Yes, ma'am. When you're in a church setting and um, let's just say you're dealing with your um, brother, sister, leaders, anyone in the um, church and you know that they're spirit filled, you know that they're in tune with God, how do you know when their prophecies or the words that they speak saying that the Lord said it, how do you know for sure when it's not? Because sometimes, you know, you hear things and you're like, I don't think that's from God. But how can you be for certain, for certain, when you just don't get the unction? You like, you know, when the Holy Spirit is not saying, that's not me. I think the number, I think that's the number one way you know. Does it bear witness with your spirit? Because there's things I've heard, I'm like, mm, that don't sound right, you know. And if it doesn't, and if it doesn't bear witness with my spirit, if it's from a prophet I trust, I will table it. If it's from a prophet I don't know, I dismiss it. Because I feel like if it's God, it'll come around again. And and does it is it does it line up with the word of God? Can you find it in scripture? And so I would say trust your spirit, trust your heart. Because a lot of times, I had a woman tell me she was in a very abusive relationship with a pastor and she felt led to divorce him. She said, but two prophets came to her and told her, you need to, quote unquote, prophets came to her and told her, you need to go back to your husband. She said that was the worst couple of years of her life. He beat her, he cheated on her, he was molesting kids, all this type of stuff, really in some egregious type of sin. But if it doesn't bear witness with your spirit, Table it. If you know them and you trust them and they've been, this is the thing, if they've been accurate before, then you can table it. But I would just table it and ask God. I just put it over here and I pray about it. If it comes up, I'll pray about it from time to time. But because if it's God, it will come to pass. And usually I, I feel like there are times in the new, so, and understand we're in, we're in a dis, different dispensation. We're in the book of Acts prophetic. There are times where a prophet will have a declaration from the Lord. But then a lot of times people are confirming something we already know. I had a prophet out of Detroit prophesy to me a couple of weeks ago. And he was so accurate to what was going on in my life and gave me some time frames about some things that I was working on. So it was very confirming to me that I was in the right place. So just put it aside and ask God. Because there is something else called prophetic timing. Like sometimes a person may not be ready. There is a well-known person in ministry. Um, the father's well-known, but I did ministry with the daughter. I've been holding a prophetic word for her for over a decade. And just recently reached out to her, hey, when we can get together. But God has been moving with, because it, she just wasn't in a place where she was ready to receive it. So some of it is timing. Some of it is, it may not be accurate. You know, because the Bible says we know in part and we prophesy in part. And everything that people say is, thus saith the Lord, is not prophecy. Some of it is opinion. Some of it is what they know, already know about you. So trust, I would say trust your spirit. You're welcome. Any more questions? Um, hey, woman of God. Uh, this is, How are you? Um, yeah, I'm doing a little better, but the pain is still there, and I think I'll be going to the hospital soon. Okay, we'll be I mean, What time is it in India right now? Um, now it is 7.30 a.m. Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll okay. Go ahead. Thank you so much. So my question is, like, um, you know, something similar to the question asked before. Um, when there is a visiting prophet to your church, for example, on a Sunday service, um, there is a visiting prophet and um, uh, you have um, heard about this uh, prophet's character from a person that you know and they had vouched for this prophet and then your pastor ends up inviting them to the church. And as they minister, you know, they prophesy um, and they prophesy literally over everybody. Um, because they've come to bless the church. Mm -hmm. 
and when they prophesy over you, some of them, what they do is um, they expose some people's sin in the air, in the open. Um, I mean, uh, first question is, is it right for somebody, or for a prophet, to expose somebody's secret sins in the air in front of everybody, the whole congregation? And yeah. Are you done with your question now, Harika? No, 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 no. Second one is okay. um, when you know a prophet from a long time who is um, legit and you've seen them prophesy over people and it's come to pass. But when it comes to a certain situation in your life, where you're so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm hearing some other voices. I'm sorry. There's like a release. Can you mute yourself? Like three or four sheets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so when you've been with, you know, you know a prophet and they have been legit in whatever word they've said and um, they know everything and at times they don't want to pray for you. Um, uh, probably like fearing warfare if they prayed for you. I mean, is that right? If so, they're intercessor. Okay. So first, initially, I don't think it's, proper prophetic protocol to call somebody sin out. I believe that that is something that if, if God has given you knowledge of that, that that's something you say to that person privately. Like I will say, I will whisper in a person's ear, say, hey, does, you know, does that bear witness for you? This is why I feel like God's showing me whatever. Because the per I feel like the only time God exposes oh. <sighs> sin is to save a person's no. life. To save a person's life because God gives us a space and time to repent and ask for forgiveness and if you are moving outside of that realm of grace and mercy I believe God will call that thing out and call it forward to let he, you know that hey I know and it's time for you to stop but I, I do I believe it has to be I, I believe it's something I would do that in private I would not do that openly but there is a scripture that says that a rebuke a person openly so everyone in, so everyone can understand about the sin. What, um, what's the scripture? Rebuke, Lisa, you know it. I see your mouth. <laughs> rebuke people openly. Yeah, to rebuke them openly that they all would fear. Yes. So there is mm -hmm. time for that. I don't believe you just go <laughs> right. I'm muting you. you, girl. But um, the second thing is, if, if I feel like some, if sometimes if somebody doesn't, I don't have a prophetic word for every single person. Like if I go to a church and minister, I don't have a prophetic word for every single person. For me, um, and the reason I was saying, Cassandra, to trust your spirit, for me, I only pray for people where I feel a pull or a draw on my spirit. Mm -hmm. Like I don't just pray for, yeah, it's, um... I don't pray for everybody. So if they don't have something for them, then I would just, if for you, I would just go to God. Mm -hmm. Because prophets, you know, prophets, you are you are operating in the prophetic along with your personality too, how your personality operates. Uh, but we're gonna yeah. pray for you, pray for your healing real quick. So Thank Father, you. I just lift up um Naharika right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We send the anointing to India, Lord. Cover. I ask that you, you we speak to her kidneys, her liver, her internal organs. God, I come against infection in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I come against every demonic attack and assignment against her life and that you would cover her. I cancel every negative word, every curse spoken over her life and we release the healing power of the Holy Spirit. And I, I decree there will be no backlash in the spirit, God, that we are covered. We release angelic um, angels on assignment in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Thank you amen. so much. Keep me posted on how you're doing, sweetheart, but we believe that you are healed in Jesus' name. Yes, I will. I will. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? 
I just wanted to piggyback on something she said. Um, um, some people believe that like once you turn on a prophetic, like you can just keep going. And um, I feel like, yes, it's, um, it's a gift and that you should be able to function in it um, because then like you have Holy Spirit and when you speak in tongues is at will. Mm -hmm. um, so that for me, it's a little controversial. Um, are all the other gifts operating in, in that same sense? Um, but I've been in services where the prophet will come in, the itinerant, and they start prophesying, and then like they're calling everybody in the church. And then I'm looking like, mm, I don't know these people, but something says that he's not. He's moving in his flesh. And I don't know if he's trying to prove a point or they're trying to, um, I don't know what they're doing, but um, I feel like when you start prophesying to everybody in the church, it becomes, it's not God. Yeah, it's not God. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think we would have to be careful there are seasons of impartation. Like I know there's time when God uses me to impart. I don't necessarily have a word for everybody, but I will enhance some people. But um, I don't think that God has a word for every single person in church because a word that you give to every single person in the church should be a word that's given over the pulpit. Like where God is speaking to a body. So then that, that should be more like a message or you know prophetic utterance. And then some people we'll talk about later too is, is we have to understand the levels of prophecy. Some people are not necessarily prophets. They're in a prophetic environment. So it's mm -hmm. atmospheric. They mm -hmm. may not have the gift of prophecy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good because um, um, I've been in churches where they thought I was a teacher because the revelation mm -hmm. that came up because of me sp preaching to them. So it, it was like the level of revelation that I had, but it, I believe that was prophetic because mm -hmm. God knew who would be there. Yes. And yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? No? Ms. Marcy? Um, it's just, oh, I know it's just, a question, <laughs> I just didn't know how to ask. I feel like my question is so broad. It, the only way it's going to really be answered for me is to really get in my word and just walk it out. But I was just thinking, you know, how do you know when it's, if, if I'm, if I'm, speaking with someone and the spirit moves and I know it's time to, it's, it's obvious because I'm flowing and the spirit will come out and I'll release a word to them. But um, there are times when God gives me revelation or word for someone. How do you know if, if the Holy Spirit doesn't specifically say, wait till October 6th, which I've never had that happen. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know when is the right time or if you should say anything, or if that was revealed to you so that you could pray. That part, I, I, don't, I don't have working knowledge of that. I'm not sure how to maneuver through that. I think it, um, it's a crapshoot, because I'm still there too. <laughs> because sometimes like God gave me a word for somebody, I had a dream about somebody that's a, a prophet. And, but I'm like, do I tell them? And it's not bad, you know, but it's like, do I tell him? Do I just pray for him? Yeah. I think some, sometimes I feel like that I just can kind of, I think it's just getting comfortable with your own spirit. I think okay. it's just kind of getting comfortable with your gift and how you flow. Yeah. So sometimes I can tell when it's like God's just speaking to me or it's something I need to share with everybody. Or if I don't feel a clear, like, mm, to share it, I don't. I'll just sit and table it until I feel like the, the dream I had a couple of nights ago, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to share that with him or I'm supposed to pray that with him. And then sometimes I'm not sure. I just move on whatever I feel like I should do. Like a few, uh, uh, three years ago, there was a, a young prophet that I knew, but I didn't know him well. 
but his face kept popping up in my dream. And so I just rolled over, hey, I just feel like, you know, I'm supposed to cover you for a season. And I know it's weird. And he's like, I totally agree. I've been watching you, blah, blah, blah. And the Holy Spirit told me to tell him, you know, guard your life because Satan is trying to systematically guard your life over the next three months because Satan is trying to systematically destroy you. And he was dead in three months. Whoa. Three months, he, he died. He by a car, coming out of church, and died on the pavement. But I'm so glad that I, I stepped out because I got time to spend with him and counsel with him and love on him and hug him. And, and what was hard for me, like reaching out, was like, God, why would that happen if you told me to reach out to him? And God clarified it for me when I went to his funeral that his sister was like, he was able to forgive and love. Mm -hmm. She said, you were his midwife. And someone said he was on hospice when he got to you. So I was just that interim voice to usher him into eternity, which freaked me out. Okay. But sometimes you just trust how you flow. Like, because I've been doing it for so long, I know how I feel on the inside. I know how I flow. And sometimes if I don't know what to do with it, I write it. Like when I, when my prophetic gift stir, when it st got activated, because God literally sent me to sit under a prophet for 15 years. When it started activating, I just started writing because I didn't know what else to do with it. So okay. I just started writing. So start writing stuff out and go back and revisit it. And just, okay. just, I think it's a crap sheet. Just figure out how to start trusting how you flow and trusting yourself because we're not delivering the word. God is delivering. I understand that, that, you know, prophecy is for edification, exhortation, which includes correction and comfort that he's, and I always tell people that if God has showed me something about your life, that he's, he has heard your cry. I'm just intersecting what your conversation with God already was. I think um, I'll say this and then be done. I think okay. I think it's because before, you know, like all of us, we were in a church mm -hmm. or under some sort of church leadership. And even if you did have that, it may or may not, depending on where you were, was the right setting, the right timing, or the right protocol to release it or say something. So you just kind of begin to know things and you just walked with them and then that's it. Mm -hmm. And so now um, that we're not in a, in a room where yeah. one person is just talking and, you know, um, and so I've, you know, like I, I have particular things or people that I'm praying for now and I'm beginning to flow mm -hmm. prophetically more than I ever have on a consistent basis. So you're right. It's just learning like, oh, you, you know, you don't, I really don't know what to do with all of it. So yeah. Okay. So you're right. on. So thank you for that. Just like we mature as people, we have to mature in our gift and our anointing. And in a church setting, the biblical um, protocol is that we go tell an elder of the church and let them judge the word. And then whether it gets released into the body or not. Because I grew up not knowing I was a prophet. We grew up, right. I didn't grow up in church. So my, I'm probably 12 years old in the prophetic. I don't know, <laughs> maybe I'm 15, but it's like, I didn't know I was prophetic. And so I, I had to like really lend myself to the prophetic and help ask the Holy Spirit to help me understand me. Okay. Like one of the things that I do flow under heavily is healing anointing and so god really uses my hands to impart but but he put me in a church with a prophet that had a healing anointing and so i got to see that in operation so so just let god mature you and i and i say always always trust your spirit we know the voice of god yeah we know the resonance of the voice of the holy spirit in us and that's really more so what I love, I rely on now is the Holy Spirit. Like, what are we doing here? You know? Okay. Amen. Thank you. Equala.
I don't have any questions. I'm just listening to everyone and just like a sponge right now. So if I have a game face on, it's just because I'm just processing smiling. everything. No, you're smiling <laughs> and I'm smiling at you. So if we don't have any more questions, Chad, probably sleepy, dear heart. It's really late in England. Sweet. I'm sweet. good. I'm just enjoying the teaching. Um, a, a question, what's, what's actually going through my mind? I'm just thinking about um, managing one's, one's mantle or man managing um, situations where, for instance, you're a prophet in the workplace, which is most of us, mm -hmm. um, and you're dealing with projections. So you're dealing with projections from, from colleagues. You know, God has put you on specific assignments, but you can literally... Um, you're literally experiencing projections all the time. So you go into the office, um, you're experiencing their projection through um, their own assignments as well. How do you manage that on a on a day to day basis when you're also having to write reports, um, do right. governance, etc.? Yeah. Yeah. So I did a video a long time ago called "Witches in the Workplace," and I actually I don't know if you. It, if I have, if you haven't read this, um, I'll send, I'll email it to you, Chair, but it's called, um, which is in the work, because I actually did an ebook called Building an Effective Battle Strategy. I'd really so appreciate I, that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll send that to you, because there are layers. Uh, first, we have to find out, is there something in us that the enemy has access to? Because he's always looking for access email chairs. Okay. And if you, who else, if you guys want it, let me know, so I'll email it out in the group. I'll just email, I'll say what you email. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, and then we have to, we have to discern. So work, the workplace worker is interesting. You have to discern it from, I believe, different levels. You have to look at it geographically, like what is happening in that region? What has happened in that region? You know, what is the origin of that company? So you have to break it all the way down and then what's going on with the department you're in. And I think once we discern those things then we can build a effective strategy. So the example would be, I worked for Kaiser Permanente Hospitals and I worked in Fontana. So I had to look at the origin of that company. The company that I worked for, the, they were management, management was it. They were on the manager side all the time. I didn't care if they, came by your house and threw balls in your house. They were always on the manager side. And 80% of the management was women. So we all know women on women crime is worse than man on man crime. And so <laughs> women tend to be very volatile in the workplace. And so, but I looked at the history, the history of Kaiser was World War II when they really got off the ground you know, Rosie the Riveter, the men went to war and the women stepped up. And so you had this strong feminist spirit in this organization. And then I believe homosexuality is part of that feminist spirit. And so you had women that were very cattle, very competitive. And there's a lot of warfare, women on women warfare, you know, in that organization because of the history of it. And then regionally, there was a lot of warfare in that region because of a lot of racial warfare in that region where I worked at. And so I think we look at all these things because we, we don't fight always against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers and people that are governing spirits that are governing those regions. So I think you have to break it all the way down. And then, and then always the word of God, declaring and decreeing the word of God over your workplace, over your department, over your boss, over yourself, because a word is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even the soul and the spirit asunder. So I will email that book out because I believe we all are marketplace people. And so I hope that helps, Chess. Very much so, thank you. You're welcome. You guys good? I know it's late, Miss Lisa. <laughs> Ready to go sleep? Where are you at, Cassandra? Cassandra? I'm actually in Georgia. Okay. And it's like 1024 my time at night. <laughs> well, I appreciate you guys being up, Chaz. I appreciate you getting on. 
Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and pray out so we can all go to sleep. It's early here. It's like 7 30, <laughs> but I'm like, girl, I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> I'm tired. So, <laughs> Father, we just thank you. Lord. We thank you that you are so amazing. Lord. And I cover every one of your daughters, Lord God. I come against backlash in the spirit, Lord God. Father, protect them, cover them. I decree supernatural peace. You said that if we would keep our mind in you, that you would keep us in perfect peace, God. So Lord, I thank you right now that, that what they've received, I decree divine impartation, Lord God, that, that it will not be plucked up by the enemy, but that it will take root and bring forth an abundant harvest in their life. I decree that every need they have is being met, Lord. And we love you so much, and we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, ladies. Amen. Love you all. Good night, everyone. So I just wanted to clarify, it's every Wednesday at 6? It'll be every Wednesday at 6. And those that, most of the people did duel with the, um, what's up, girl? I see you. Sherelle. She's at work. But most of them signed up for both of them. So I, I'm just probably going to combine it into one email. So the interceptors is Saturdays 9, 9 to 10.30. That's the exact time of my family prayer call, so I'm not. No, that's okay. That always, well, you can always watch the recording. Okay. Yeah, I record everything. Okay. And then I'll just send out the access to everything. Everybody can have everything. How about that? That makes it easier for me. But I love you guys. Sleep. Love you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> have a good night. Bye guys. Bye. 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 Bye.